This is a known as Worship, Grow, Serve, Live podcast for September 24th, 2023, Peaks and Valleys Part 6, God Works for Good, with Dr. Jack Stevenson. This is one of our sermon series episodes produced by Anona United Methodist Church. For more information and video versions, visit anona.com forward slash sermon series. If you're new to Anona and wish to learn more about our community, go to anona.com forward slash welcome. And now for another great message. Tomorrow is Yom Kippur. And we claim a Judeo-Christian heritage, but sometimes there's not a lot of Judeo in our Christian heritage, and it comes to high holidays that way. This is like Christmas or Easter for the Jewish faith. It is their big yearly holiday, Yom Kippur. So I did a a search through rabbis to hear what they wrote or spoke about Yom Kippur, not trusting my, now I'm a professor of world religion, so it's not like I don't know what Yom Kippur is, but I wanted to hear it from a rabbi's perspective. And one rabbi in particular, he's a psychologist and a rabbi, and he works with unremittent alcoholism, alcoholism that doesn't break, that doesn't recover, with the worst of the worst. They've lost all their money, all the people in their lives, nobody wants to talk to them. And he said, one of the most hopeless places you can be as a human being is where you have to blame everyone else. Says there's no recovery from this position. Think about that. No recovery from this position. Why? Because if it's everyone else's fault, what can you do? You are ultimately helpless because you didn't do it. He goes on to say, and to blame God is the ultimate of this when God is your very present help in time of need instead of the one who causes this to happen. And so I have chosen for you today, I sound like a chef, I have chosen for you today three scriptures, an Old Testament, a Psalm, and a New Testament. Those of you who've been going to church a long time, remember when preachers preachers used to do that all the time? Had an Old Testament reading, a Psalm, a New Testament reading. I'm going to begin with a story in the Old Testament, but to do it, let me begin with a rabbi old story. And here's the fun thing I realized today. I was this old today when I realized I don't need to tell an old preacher's story anymore. If it comes out of my mouth, it is (laughs) an old preacher's story by definition. Isn't that fun? So now I just talk and it's an old preacher's story. But there's an old rabbi story about uh, a young man who falls and breaks his leg and he says, this is terrible. And the rabbi goes, I don't know. And then war comes and while his leg is broken, all the young men are conscripted to go out and they all die except him. And he says, this is a good thing. And the rabbi goes, I don't know. And so because he's the only guy left, he marries the most beautiful woman in the village. And he goes, this is a good thing. And the rabbi goes, I don't know. She turns out to be a real shrew and a hateful person and the rest of his life is terrible. And he says, this is a bad thing. And what does the rabbi say? What is God going to do with it? What's going to come out of this, whether it's good or whether it's bad? Let's take that old rabbi perspective and go into the first scripture. See, I told you I was going to do it backwards. So let's go to the first scripture, looking at what is God going to do with this? Is it good or is it bad? And we don't know because we can't see that far. So you know the story of Joseph, to remind you about your old Sunday school days, Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We're about that far into Genesis. Joseph has 12 brothers. They hate him because the dad says he's the favorite. Way to go, dad. This one's my favorite. That's gonna set everybody up to play well together. 
So they hate him and they throw him down a well. They tear his coat up, send it back to dad saying, "Uh, he died. Then they sell him into slavery. Then he's under the slavery of a guy named Potiphar and the wife accuses him of wanting to have sex with her and he's thrown into jail. Now, you would think a guy like that would lose his faith. But a greater question the rabbi would ask is what is God going to do with this? And so in the telling of the story, the author has it like this. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am I in the place of God? That's an old Jewish way of saying, am I going to judge you? Am I considering myself God that I would judge you? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing right now. The rest of the story is Joseph was a real smart guy and he prophesied because he stayed in prayer with God, um, seven skinny calves, seven fat calves, seven skinny, you know, you know the, okay, there were seven fat cows which says store up all the grain, there were seven skinny cows which would be famine. So everybody lived in Egypt because Joseph had stayed close to God and delivered Egypt out of famine. More than that, he forgave his family and loved them. And in the end, it's a beautiful story of reconciliation and love. And I ask you this old rabbi question because Yom Kippur is tomorrow. The real faith question isn't why did God do this? In fact, as the rabbi was telling us, that blames God. Why did God do this meant I'm helpless because God did this. Dorothy Soleil, a great systematic theologian, German theologian, wrote a book called Suffering, where she blamed the 1700s uh, theologians for trying to figure out God so completely that they defined God and what God would and wouldn't do. Now, Martin Luther in the 1500s said, no human can understand God. But they said, God is so powerful that everything that happens happens because God intended it to happen. Now, God never said that. The Bible never said that. But they said that. If that's true, Dorothy Soleil says in her book, Suffering, and God intended for a child to be hit by a car, I'm not sure I can worship that God who intends for a child to be crushed under a car and looks upon that as God's will accomplished. Dorothy Sillay goes on to challenge that 1700s view of God as the villain. She comes, I hope I can say this without crying. It's 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 a very deep theological work, but it's a beautiful work. She says, the God that I love And the only God I would love is crying with me. Does God want a child to be crushed or is God not wanting that any more than you are? The question of Joseph's scripture really is, is God gonna leave it there? Is God going to leave Joseph in the well? Is God going to leave him sold to slavery? Is God going to leave him in jail? What is God going to do with all this sorrow? Because God will not leave it alone. And that's the great faith you and I can have today. God doesn't like it either. And God won't let it rest. Now that's one view of divine providence using a German theologian and an old rabbi. But let's let's move to the Psalms to hear more of a lifelong trust. The psalmist says, I will trust in you for you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, Oh, Lord, from the time that I was a kid, do you hear the simplicity that cuts through the doubt and the blame? 
I trust God. When, when the psalmist writes, the psalmist is writing all the time about how I am surrounded by my enemies. It looks hopeless. It looks terrible. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now that doesn't mean you're having a good day. A person who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it means my enemies are in high places on both sides of me and have the advantage coming down the valley. That is not a good time or place. Yea, though, I'm there. I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. It doesn't say you're going to take away the enemies. It doesn't say you're going to take away where I am or what's going on. But you're not going to have me face this alone. And in that, I trust you. I trust you, God. I have trusted you since I was a child. If you can't hear the first point, if you can't hear the What is God going to do with all this? You can trust. Hear the second one. Trust. God has loved you since you were a kid and God is trustable in your life. In the midst of the bad things, not the cause of the bad things. Listen to Dorothy Soleil. Not the cause of the bad things, but in the midst of the bad things, God will not leave you alone. Which leads us to the gospel. Let's read some New Testament. We know that this causes all kinds of problems for people. This scripture gets people in such trouble. That all things work together for good, and then it has these conditions. For those who love God, and for those who are called according to his purpose. And God save us from Christians giving bad advice and being uppity and self-righteous. Why is this happening to you? Well, you know, things go good for people who love God and who are living according to his purpose. So, there. Obviously, you're not holding your mouth right in life. And then if they're really crummy Christians, they go ahead to tell them how they're not doing it right. God save us from self-righteousness. Telling people who are suffering why they're suffering, like you know. Well, you, yeah. (laughs) Karma, you know. Goes around, comes around, jerk. Do me a favor. If you feel that coming on, leave. I would rather you not be there then bring comforting words of self-righteousness and judgment. All things work for good for those who live God, who, who live according to his purpose. I have lived according to his purposes. I gave my life to Christ at 12 years old. I have lived nothing but for Christ. I gave my profession to Christ. And yet sorrow has and does hit me like a sledgehammer. I have been betrayed, I've been broken, I've been hurt. To say bad things won't happen to you if you love God just isn't biblical. And so if we lose our faith because something bad happens, it's like a hiker with a compass who when he sprains his ankle on the trail, takes the compass and crashes it on the rock, saying, you led me here. Well, what does he need now to get out of the forest? It would be good to know where north is and where town is and where, I don't know, a 24-hour clinic might be. But what does he not have now? See, when you blame God, you don't have God. And when you don't have God, there is no what is God going to do with this and hope flies out the window and you end up bitter and jerky. And God save us from bitter, jerky Christians, especially on the inside. Don't do that to yourself. Don't be the blaming everybody, including God, person because there is no sanity there. 
The valley is a time to reach out, to trust, to have faith that your God will not leave you there. And though it hurts like the dickens, it's not the end of the story. That's what resurrection is. Resurrection is Jesus saying, no matter what this life does to you, it is not the end of the story. I am the end of the story. And I will stand with you at the end of time so that all screw-ups you did, I'm going to be right beside you saying, yeah, Lord, I know, I know he did all that. Whew. But I love him. That's it. That's what eternity is. Forgiveness of all that is past. In a life of love and joy and peace evermore. But my friends, you don't have to wait until you die. Stop blaming God. And by the way, Yom Kippur, the holiday tomorrow, is stop blaming other people. It's stop blaming other people day. It's saying, that one's on me. <laughs> I did it. I'm the cause. I'm the fault. Say to God, God, I'm sorry. I am sorry I blamed you. You could say that. You could say, I'm sorry I screwed up. You could say that. I could say that every day. You, if you're lucky enough to have a spouse around, you could turn to your spouse and say, it's my fault and I'm sorry. Now, have 911 standing by. Have it pre-dialed on your phone. Because if you do have a spouse, they probably don't hear that all the time. But it's Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. It's the day to say, I'm sorry to God and to each other and to own stuff. So it begins tonight about sunset. God help you. When I designed this part of the flow of worship, I called it a Paul Harvey moment. Back then, we knew who Paul Harvey was. For those of you who don't know, Paul Harvey had a radio show, and he ended it with some little quip at the end like this. Imagine being that rabbi, dedicating your life to nothing but being with unsuccessful alcoholics who blame everybody else. What a tough place to be. What a tougher place to be would be one of those people who was blaming everybody else and couldn't recover. And a question to ask us on Yom Kippur is why do we do that to ourselves? If you found this message meaningful, share it with others. To find more great episodes and stay up to date, subscribe to the United Methodist Church's podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere you find your favorite podcast shows. In addition, subscribe to our channel on YouTube and find the community on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Anona Church. You can join us on our campus in Largo, Florida and discover new ways to reach out to the Pinellas County community. Be a part of the Anona Church family as we worship, grow, serve, and live.